Hare Krishna, welcome to my channel. I've been wanting to do a video for a couple of weeks now. It's been a very busy time of change for me personally and also as we've seen, it's been a very turbulent time in this world. I've been thinking that for a month or so, I've been thinking it's been a kind of churning of the ocean. You see in the Vedic scriptures how the ocean was churned and the demonic forces and the divine forces, the forces of the demigods and demons, they were churning the ocean. And what you, it shows like effort. They were working, uh, using a lot of energy to try to manifest their desires, you could say. And in general, in the world that we're present at now, in this time of the pandemic and also social unrest, it's a time of churning. So also it's been a very deep time of uh, reflection for me personally. And so I'll just share some of my thoughts with you. And it's also been interesting because a lot of the times we see in someone's spiritual journey or life journey, the internal development also, or you could say internal conflict or internal chaos also seems to match a lot of times some external turbulence, you could say. So it's been a turbulent time for the world in general. And also personally, I've been going through a lot of reflections. Specifically, what I want to share to you, with you today is about what is my story that, um, you know, here I have a ch public channel and also I'm managing our websites and our Bhakti mission. So what is that all about? What am I doing here? What is my motivation? What is our purpose? What is our vision? I'd like to share that to you. And also just to show you... Uh, because this is kind of the externalization of my internal meditation. Um, what is my purpose here in life? And why am I doing this? Why am I a brahmachari living in the Ma and trying to serve my Gurudev's mission? So for me, it starts obviously from childhood. I grew up, my parents are Hare Krishna devotees in the Hare Krishna movement. And when I was very young, already we were starting to chant. And my mother and father have so many fond memories. I grew up in a farm kind of like a farmstead in uh, Badger, California. Uh, actually, we have like Anukut festivals there every year, Giriraj festivals, even uh, before Sri Gurudev came. So it was a beautiful place where the community would gather and we had a lot of friends and a lot of other devotee families. And so we would spend a lot of time with them. So it was a very nice devotional upbringing. But even <clears throat> saying that, I mean, very quickly into my life, we met our Sri Gurudev. And so meeting Sri Gurudev was a very a transformational time immediately. So the story of that, many p other people have uh, spoken about that. It's a very sweet story also. Um, to really get into it in detail would take a long time. In essence, Arshila Gurudev was a great saint in the Bhakti tradition, in the Gaudiya Vaishnav lineage. And he was a contemporary and friend of Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is the founder of Chari of Iskon. And so he actually did the sannyas ceremony for Swami Prabhupada, he encouraged him and helped him in those times. And also when he was in the West, he was um, connected to him. They wrote many letters back and forth. He was helping him. And then when Swami Bhaktivedanta Prabhupada was preparing to depart this world, he also requested, I should agree with Srimad Bhaktivedanta Naranga Swami Maharaj, he requested him, you should help my disciples. And you should, uh, he even requested him to come to the West. So when my Srila Gurudev first came to the West, he first went in May 5th. Uh, first he went to Holland. After that, he went to the United Kingdom. And he was telling everyone there that I am coming here because of uh, it's the desire of my Shiksha Gurudev Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada that he has called me to come. And he requested me to come when he started in the 70s and uh, in the 60s. And then he was requesting him to come in the early 70s. And he said, I was very busy in my service to the mission of my Gurudev. But then very soon after that, when... <clears throat> You know, when he was departing, he requested me again. So I'm coming here because he has requested me to come and help care for his disciples, help encourage and nourish their bhakti, their creeper of devotion that helps them realize their true identity, their true spiritual self and their relationship with the Absolute. So then my, my Guru Maharaj, my Srila Gurudev, from when he first came in 96 to Holland and then to England, after that he immediately came to the West Coast, the uh, USA. And he came to Houston, then he came to Los Angeles and... New Brudge, Badger, what became known as New Brudge. So that was a very special time. Actually, we had a nice community there, but um, we were in some kind of uh, doubt because officially our Gurudev had been, what you could say, um, there was a political time going on. And in 94, he had been officially, you could say, not welcome in many of the ashram and temples in the ISKCON society. So he had been helping 
many of the leadership in Iskon and many devotees for many years, but for political reasons, there was some uh, something that caused some disturbance in that, and that's a long history. Um, but regardless, the point is that he was a very, um, very loved leader in the Vaishnav communities in India, and many devotees in Iskon actually had been requesting him to come to the West ever since, especially he was banned. And he had said, now that they have done this, I will be like a lion. He said, they will not be able to hold me back because this is my service for my Shiksha Gurudev, Srila Bhaktivedanta Swami Swaipro. But he said, I am actually, you know, he is my Shiksha Guru, so I'm like his first disciple, he said. Before he even officially started ISKCON, I had a relationship with him since, even in the 40s, the late 40s, he, since then he knew him. And he had a close relationship, living with him uh, for years. So therefore... Um, our community, because we're in the, the ISKCON community, it wasn't under the GBC authority, but it was a devotee community regardless that was connected to ISKCON. So they, we had a community meeting of whether we should allow uh, Srila Bhakti Rantaranga Swami Maharaj to come. And I remember Gopavindra Paul Prabhu, uh, Shravan Prabhu's father, uh, Prabhupada disciple, he was saying, look, you know, he's a very sweet, loving Vaishnav, he can give some nice Harikata. He's only coming for three days, they've invited him for three days, and don't worry, you know, if he says anything we don't agree with, anything against our Siddhanta, we can request him to go. And, you know, anyhow, after three days he'll go and everything will go back to normal. So that was something that devotees like to say as like something kind of humorous because uh, nothing could be, you know, further from the truth. Everything did not go back to normal. Rather, um, what had become like a barren desert, you could say in some sense, because um, we didn't have that nourishment of a real saintly devotee who is... Um, really touched with that grace of the divine, you could say, that grace of the transcendental realm of Braj, that love and that sweetness and that power to just sweep you up in a current of, of loving devotion. It wasn't really, uh, it, that force wasn't there. So when he came, you know, it was like a flood of that transcendental uh, current of divine grace. And so the whole community got swept up into that you know, most of our families there immediately were so charmed by him that immediately we began to follow him everywhere. And so for the next, you could say, 14, 15 years, it became like a spiritual uh, caravan. Wherever he would go and have uh, uh, Harikata festivals, then most of our community and other communities around the world would just follow him. And we'd have festivals in Europe and especially in India, Kartik and, and uh, Navadweep. And we would have festivals that would, you know, wherever he would go, basically, it would be a divine festival of what we, uh, it, bhakti, what does it mean? It means, you know, praising, you know, the absolute reality, Shishrata Krishna, loving reality, and kirtan, harikata, feasts, dancing. It's a very, uh, if you haven't experienced what is like a bhakti festival, then you may not uh, understand this so much. But if you're in a really powerful bhakti festival, especially with really all, the, everything depends on the association that you're in. You know, so if you're in the association of these personalities who really have this, uh, or touched with that spiritual divine grace, you could say, then it's such, a, it's such an amazing experience you can never even imagine. So for us, when he came to our community first, I was just nine years old. And that first year from that moment, we were all swept up in it. So my father and I, we came to India that first year for Kartik, Braj Mandal Parikrama. And that year in Kartik, Braj Mandal, it's such an amazing festival. It's... Um, Again, it's one of those things that you could speak on about for, for hours. And literally, we have books describing all the, the beautiful activities in that time and all the places we go to. But that time for me, was, it was actually a very amazing time because I was brought up as a, a Hare Krishna devotee. I was brought up as a bhakti boy, you know. And so for me, naturally, you're kind of first exposed to what you would call like the real, real thing. You know, we had been doing it. We had been chanting. We were taking prasad. We were, the, the ground was fertile for it because that's kind of Prabhupada's vision, create a Vanashram Dharma, fertile ground for the development of the, the real devotion. But the most important thing in bhakti is ultimately the association, having the connection to someone like that. So for us, with Gurudev and the culture of Braj, it was such a transformational time. That, for me, was my first really powerful spiritual experience when I was nine because just the austerity of it, uh, you're living as like a traveling mendicant for a month, wandering around all these holy places barefoot, eating very simply, all day absorbed in the you know, divine discourses and chants and the kirtan. And just amazing transformational experience. So that year, I received initiation with my father in Kartik, 96. My father got what's called second initiation or in general Brahmin initiation, established as a real Brahmin. 
what is that meaning uh, to be a brahmin there's different ideas people think it's by birth but real brahmin initiation means you're becoming uh, initiated into this path of uh, service to the transcendent entities you're you're aligning your energies with uh, the Br brahman you could say the absolute truth and so to be a real Brahmin means to know Brahman and to live within Brahman. So that's what is a real Brahmin. So my father received that and I received what's called first initiation, which is Harinam, receiving the names of the Lord, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So you receive this mantra, you sit in a fire sacrifice, you know, and you perform this samskar, which is called like the ceremony, which gives a deep impression in the heart and mind. So after that, I remember I told my Gurudev that uh, I was nine, so that's when I received the name Rasik Mohan. Before, my name was Rama, Rama Roy. And um, that first year, I received my spiritual name, Rasik Mohan. That other name is also a devotee name, Ram, you know, the name of the great hero of the Sanskrit epics, the Ramayan. So then my name, our, what our specialty of our Gurudev was, is that he gave us this mood of Braj. And so this name, Rasik Mohan, it's immediately more connected to the moods of Braj. Rasik means the charmer. Uh, like it's a name for Krishna, he who charms, or he who is actually Mohan is more the charmer, Rasik is the taster. He who is expert at relishing rasa. Rasa means the exchange of love between uh, someone, anyone who has love for each other, that exchange of love between them is called rasa. And so there's different kinds of exchange. Uh, rasa, you could say it's any kind of emotion or mellow. Uh, in general, in bhakti, it means the rasa of your relationship. So if you're in the mood of like the mother Yashoda, the, the mother for her child, Krishna, or the father, or the friends, or th those in the more mellows of romantic love, then Rasik means those who taste that mellow of love. And Mohan means those who are like the bewilderer or the charmer. So Rasik Mohan is a very sweet name because it's a name for Krishna who is expert at charming his devotees and relishing the sweetness of their loving exchanges. That is the meaning of Rasik Mohan. So I received that name from my Gurudev at nine. But I told my Gurudev that, look, you gave my father like level two. Why did I just get level one? And he said, okay, next year when I come again, I'll, maybe I'll give you it. He said, I said, he said, maybe, you know. So I said, okay, I'm going to hold you to it. I remember like, okay, I'm going to hold you to it. And um, he smiled and it was very sweet. So immediately meeting him, it was, it, was a very, it was like meeting your spiritual father. That's the meaning of Guru. Meeting your Guru means you're connecting. Real Guru is someone that you're connecting to who is... It's not just a material connection or formal relationship. The idea of real guru is that it's this spiritual, you could say dormant, but eternal in principle. And so you're connecting to that spiritual principle of our understanding is that our transcendental guru is someone we have eternal, the potential for an eternal relationship within the transcendental world, the realm of Braj, uh, with Krishna, which is his eternal land of love and devotion. So we have that eternal kind of relation. So immediately there's a connection. If you meet you're a real guru. It's like counterfeit guru versus genuine bona fide guru. You can't really compare the two. It's like a fake note versus a genuine note. Externally, it may look similar, but with a fake note, you can't actually get the goods that you want to get. So the real guru that has a, it's a completely another level. And it doesn't just mean someone who's charismatic, who can help self-help or something. Real guru is something very, uh, very divine, you would say. So we got that a relationship. Then when my Gurudev came, the next year I was 10 in Badger 97, and I received that Brahmin second initiation. What I remember very clearly, and this is for me like a big, you could say, there's many milestones in my kind of journey. So for me, what I would say is like the first deep impression for me, and I want to give you like some concrete, like I said, like what are the three words that kind of define my uh, mission in life? or my service or dharma in this life. So at that age of 10, when he gave me the second initiation, he said, look, now you're a young boy. And he would go, every time he would meet me, it would be very sweet. He would come for class and then he would walk back to his room, you know, holding his hand on your shoulder. It was very, he developed a very like loving, relate, you know, kind of, he would give a lot of nourishment in that way, especially to, we had many uh, children there in the community growing up. So it was very sweet. Him being, at that point, he was like 80. No, 75, 74, 75. So it was a very, um, it was like having your grandfather show you a lot of uh, affection at that time. So then when I was 10, and that, from that point on, he would tell me like, look, you're a kid now. I want that when you grow up, you know, he would use, he would use the height because it's very, you know, okay. It's a very tangible thing. Okay, like you're like this now. When you're like this now, I want you to come to the mat. 